I used to love playing video games. It was my favorite pastime. I remember very vividly spending at least an hour before school every morning to squeeze in a little bit of extra time in my own virtual worlds. It gave me a sense of escape and control where I could escape from the real world in games like Minecraft. In Minecraft, I got to build redstone contraptions and farms and booby traps that I would pl uh, prank my friends with after school. It wouldn't be until nearly a decade later that I would be able to make my own virtual worlds from scratch, though. Fast forward to my sophomore year of college. In my physics class, with the help of my best friends, I got to build my own pool game. It wasn't much, and it certainly wasn't Minecraft by any stretch of the imagination, but it was an opportunity for me, me to be able to play with the laws of physics and the constants within and see how they impact the gameplay in the world I was building firsthand. I realized once you remove the user input, it became a simulation of our world. I found this fascinating, and shortly after, I got into numerical research in astrophysics. I was completely baffled how you could plug in the laws of physics onto a computer and effectively play God, simulating complex structures like galaxy formation. And at the heart of those galaxies, you can even simulate the most complex environments our universe has to offer, such as a black hole, where light can literally orbit around the black hole due to the strong gravitational pull. And if you're careful and physically motivated, you can even make predictions that match what we see in reality. I learned through this process that programming really fundamentally comes down to three concepts. The first of which is that those functions or those equations that I was playing around with in my physics classes, they could be written as functions that just take in inputs and spit out outputs. The beauty of programming is that those functions could actually be anything your heart desires, text, images, and even video. And when you build these functions in tandem with pe what people have already built before you, you can quite literally stand on the shoulders of giants and make something truly spectacular. The second idea that I came across was that of objects. In my pool game, that looked like objects like pool sticks or pool balls or even the rack. I was fascinated by this, and it helped me build my virtual worlds. When you take these objects and combine them with the outputs of your functions, you can store them in the form of data in what we call data structures in the computer's memory and use them as needed. Once I understood these three concepts, the world of software became more demystified for me, and it made a lot more sense. My favorite example of how you can take a complex idea and make it simpler is through AI. If you've Googled AI, you might have come across the neural network. The neural network is the fundamental building block behind modern day AI and machine learning. At a first glance, there's a lot of lines and circles and it's confusing, easy to be turned away immediately. But I encourage you just to sit with me for a moment and let me show you that it's not that bad. At the heart of it, all those circles are really just nodes. They're objects that behave like functions that take in a set of inputs and spit out an output. And when you combine these in a complex web with others, you can actually get human-like behavior that mimics what we see in our own behavior. The more data and more examples of reality that you, you give it, the more human-like it becomes. And we call this artificial intelligence. My favorite example of what you can do with this technology is make imagery. Never before made by a human, this is completely computer generated, such as penguins getting married at Christmas time or the universe inside of a bubble, or even a man riding a supernova, Albert Einstein walking through the streets of New York City in the style of Van Gogh, and even a cat eating a pancake. When people think of programmers, they typically think of hackers breaking into the Pentagon, or the next Google software developer making a million dollar app. But nobody stops and thinks about artists. I think that's changing as we enter this new digital era. Just recently, within the past month, a team of visual effects artists created the first anime drawn not by humans, but by artificial intelligence. But I want to stress that they would not have been capable of doing this if they didn't have a basic understanding of how to program in the first place. These tools are great out of the box, but they're truly extraordinary when you can maximize their potential with a little bit of programming knowledge. But it doesn't just stop at art. Text-based AI is completely changing the way we do just about anything. You might have heard of ChatGBT, a technology, an AI that can generate human-like responses in the form of text, songs, poems, lyrics, 
Even TED Talks can be written by ChatGPT. But don't worry, I only use it to make the title of this one. And if Bill Gates said it's important, then it must be, right? Even if your teachers aren't too thrilled about it in the first place. I feel that as we take steps further and further into this new digital era, powered by AI, those that don't learn how to embrace it and learn how to maximize its potential might get left behind. According to the BBC, the average person spends nearly five hours of their day on their smartphone. That's nearly a third of the time we spend awake. Yet 99% of us have almost no idea how this works at all, how the underlying software machinery works. The flip side of this is that 1% of our population is actually equipped with the skills and tools they need to turn their ideas into lucrative realities. But the sad part is that most of those people already either work for or with big tech corporations. It almost feels like the rich are getting richer. But I want to stress that not all programmers are software developers. A huge fraction of them are actually scientists and engineers. Programming is becoming one of the most essential skills in STEM today. It's becoming an essential staple of college curriculum across the world. Data scientist is one of the fastest growing occupations in the next decade, according to the US Labor Bureau. The simple skill of being able to pull data straight from its source, look at the trends, and tie those trends to real world events and give insights as to how the world works is an invaluable skill that nearly any employer is looking for these days. For example, being able to look at movie theater stock over the last decade and notice a steady increasing trend in their performance. Yet suddenly, abruptly, coinciding right at the beginning of 2020, we see a huge unprecedented dip. I wonder what that could be. During the pandemic, it felt like nearly everybody was arguing. People were completely disagreeing and quoting statistics that didn't even make sense, completely disagreeing with each other. It was hard to tell what was real and what was fake. But how do you know what's real and what's fake? In principle, you can compare all your resources side by side and look for the common threads of truth. But the harsh reality is that people simply just don't have the time or care enough to do so. The other possibility is that you could pull the data straight from the source and cut out the middleman entirely, allowing yourself to make decisions based completely off of the data and not somebody's opinion. But the harsh reality is, is that we're just not taught this in school. You either have to learn this in higher education or on your own in most places. I think this is an issue. During the pandemic, according to the Pew Research Center, 88% of Americans felt that they were either confused or that they even shared fake news with other people from both sides of the political aisle. Yet in the same vein, only 6.9 million Americans work in jobs or occupations that require programming to some extent. That's 2% at best of our population that is capable to be able to pull data straight from its source and fact check the news. In a room full of 100, that responsibility falls on only two people to make sure that everybody is well informed and has the facts straight. That's a fundamental assumption at the heart of what makes a democracy work, and we're not meeting that requirement. I think this is a huge issue. And I fear that 2% of our population being able to do this, this essential skill of pulling data straight from a source, which I call code literacy, because it requires a basic understanding of programming, I feel that this 2% is not enough, and it will have huge implications in the decades to follow. Just for reference, in 1870, nearly five years after the abolition of slavery in this country, 20% of people of color Nearly a factor of 10 more were considered literate, being capable of reading and writing, and we're still dealing with those issues to this day. But I want to stress that this 2% code literacy issue that our country is facing doesn't have to stay that way. You, the youth, can make a huge difference as we move forward. Simply spreading the word to your friends and your family and your teachers that this is an issue can go a huge way. You might even be using virtual resources which have plenty of individualized and free curriculum to teach yourself how to program. And you might already be using these to study for your other courses or even your college entrance exams. And if you're afraid and you think that coding is really difficult and scary, I encourage you to give it a chance. You'd be surprised how, how likely you probably have already done it in a different form. Little did I know when I was a kid, 
playing Minecraft and building redstone contraptions that I was actually programming. I just didn't see it yet. And you've probably done the same interacting with a computer. So if you get a chance to take a programming course in either computer science or data science, I encourage you to. It can go a long way towards improving your code literacy as well. I feel that if we take care of this now, we'll be well equipped to handle global issues that affect the lives of not just millions, but billions of people across the world. Issues like climate change, for example. This is a real problem. There is unprecedented changes to the Earth's climate within the last hundred years. It's clear, it's concise, it's in the data, day and night. You could pull it straight from NASA yourself. Yet a shockingly large fraction of our population doesn't even believe it's real. If you don't believe me that it's real, I encourage you, in fact, I challenge you to look at the data yourself and ask yourself, I wonder what happened here. Thank you.